One of my favorite lines in Douglas Adams' uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is when he's describing um, the alien invasion fleet that's come to destroy the Earth. And he says, the spaceships hung in the air in exactly the way a brick doesn't. Now, that's funny because it's not very informative. Uh, and I'm about to give a, a little video about what philosophy isn't. So maybe there's the same problem. But I'm going to do it anyway because I want to clear up a few common confusions that I come across particularly when I'm grading people's first attempts to write a philosophy paper. Uh, and you know, it's nobody's fault because you haven't written a philosophy paper before, but I just want to um, rule out some possible confusions before they occur. So, the first thing that philosophy isn't is psychology. I get it. Um, I think people are drawn to both philosophy and psychology out of desires to understand um, psychology. You, you're drawn to psychology if you're a weirdo who doesn't understand people and wants to attempt to come up with some theories. Uh, because, let's face it, everybody who goes into psychology is, is pretty weird. Um, but psychology and philosophy uh, do very different things. For one thing, uh, psychology gives, as far as philosophers are concerned, the wrong kind of reasons uh, when they explain something. So there's a difference between uh, psychological explanations for things versus arguments. And philosophers, here's a little bit of positive information about ph what philosophy is. Philosophy is concerned with arguments, with giving reasons for things. Now, um, reasons can also be used in a psychological sense, but, uh, well, let, let me illustrate the difference. Um, suppose you've got two kids and they're fighting, one hits the other, and you say, okay, Timmy, why did you hit uh, your sister? And what you're looking for is a reason, and you're looking for a reason that will justify the behavior. Uh, what you're not looking for is the kind of psychological explanation. So if Timmy responds by saying, you know, why did I hit my sister? Well, my brain sent an electro, uh, electrical signal to the muscles of my arm and it caused my arm to go like that. That is an explanation of why the event happened, why the um, why the hand hit the person. But it's not the reason, it doesn't justify it, which is what you're looking. You're looking for the kind of explanation that makes sense to the, that the person doing it would give. Psychological explanations tend to look at uh, the person involved from outside and treat them as kind of like a machine. Um, another instance where this comes up is, for example, a, uh, a piece I commonly assign in intro classes is a piece by uh, the great writer Tolstoy called My Confession, which is about a, a crisis in his life. Um, and it's a crisis where suddenly his life appears to have no meaning, or he doesn't see the meaning of his behavior, and it kind of paralyzes him. And it's at the point when he, he's at his most successful and doing what he loves to do. So it's particularly bewildering to him. And students writing on this are so tempted to say, oh, he's just depressed, or, you know, he had a nervous breakdown or something. But here he is in this essay pouring out the internal dialogue about he's looking for reasons, he's searching for reasons in himself, and students are just saying, oh, he's depressed, he needs to take a Prozac or something. That's so arrogant and dismissive of his internal debate. It's as if saying that wrestling with the great issues of meaning is just something that depressed people do and we can fix that with a pill. Uh, so it's, 
it's kind of enraging. Uh, so don't do that. Don't, don't psychoanalyze um, philosophers. Don't psychoanalyze anybody. I mean, uh, for example, if uh, in a philosophy paper it says, why do people believe in something? Let's say God. Why do people believe in God? Um, what I'm not looking for is a psychological explanation, like Freud famously gave an explanation that God is sort of a father replacement. When you grow up and you can't be looked after by your, your father anymore, you invent this sort of father figure in the sky. That, again, treats the person, the believer, very dismissively. It says they don't really understand their own motivations. And even if it's true, what I'm looking for is, is there a reason that justifies belief? Not, is there an explanation for why people believe? So, that is a common um, mistake that people make. Don't make it. Philosophy isn't psychology. And philosophy also isn't a debate contest. Now, I'm kind of going blind here because I've never actually been involved in a debate contest. But um, I see people who have, like apparently the Senator Ted Cruz was like a national debate contest winner, and I think, okay, uh, I'm, I'm pretty glad I avoided that. Um, this actually goes back way to the early days of philosophy. If philosophers have a secular saint or a sort of Jesus figure for uh, the non-Christians, you know, there are plenty of Christian philosophers and their Jesus figure is Jesus, but uh, for the rest of philosophers, it's Socrates. Socrates is uh, sort of the philosopher superhero because he essentially died for philosophy. He was a guy who just hung out in, in the marketplace in Athens and buttonholed people and uh, argued with them and as a result pissed off so many influential people that he got sentenced to death. But Socrates uh, was always getting into disagreements with the sophists. And the sophists were essentially debate, super debate winners. Uh, they trained people uh, at debate. And in fact, one of their most famous boasts was that they could train you on any side of a debate. They could train you to win. This was a, a sort of party trick of a famous sophist that he would give an incredibly convincing argument on one side of a debate and then he would flip over to the other side of the debate and give you an incredibly convincing argument on that side. And the, the claim is that there's, there's no real truth, there's just winning the argument. Philosophers call us naive, we believe, that, we believe that there's a possibility of truth and that the point of philosophy is to arrive at that truth. Um, and again, the correct means of getting to truth is arguments, not rhetoric, not little tricks that will win over your audience. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit, that kind of thing. Not um, appealing to emotions, not uh, winning them over, just looking at the arguments. So uh, Socrates, in, in his Apology, which is the... Um, his defense in his trial is saying, look, I don't know how to do this. I am very rough and ready. I'm not trying to win you over. I'm trying to arrive at the truth. I do, the, the thing I do most is to ask you questions. This is famously the Socratic method. So it's not about winning the argument. You should be prepared to be convinced that you are wrong. Now, of course, philosophers are human and they like to win and this doesn't happen all that often. But that's the ideal. The ideal is uh, together we're going to get to the truth. If you're right, I will, be, I will happily admit that my side is wrong. The other thing is, uh, again, sophists and, and debating comp contests, you are assigned a position to argue for. Um, so consequently, you know, somebody arguing against you can say, oh, well, you would argue that because that's your position. So you're doing anything you can to bolster that position. If one reason doesn't work, you're going to try and come up with another one. But in philosophy, your position should be the result 
the result of, uh, of the arguments, not the cause of the arguments. If you have a position, it's not because you say, oh, well, I'm going to take this position and then argue for it. No, you should have no position until you have convinced yourself that there is good reason for it. You know, a, uh, an opinion is in philosophy a privilege, not a right. You should only have an opinion on a topic if uh, you've got a good reason for it and not because, well, I'm just going to argue for it and see if I can, if I'm slick enough to defeat anybody. Okay, the third thing that philosophy isn't is it's not about personalities. Again, um, philosoph people who teach philosophy and study philosophy aren't really consistent on this. Uh, they, we tend to crush on particular figures. You get interested in a figure and you kind of identify with the person and you like them. But this is dangerous because these are people in the past and you can find out things about them that are truly horrific. I mean, um, the philosopher George Berkeley, after whom the city Berkeley is named, because it's spelt the same, only pronounced differently, uh, they just took his name off uh, a library in the university in Ireland, which is where he's from, uh, because they uncovered pamphlets he'd written justifying slavery and he advocated for slavery and it's like oh god you know now how do you feel about teaching this guy's uh, stuff on metaphysics well divorce the argument from the source you're just interested in the arguments anybody can give these arguments Hitler was a vegetarian suppose he gave a really good argument for vegetarianism you can't dismiss it just because Hitler gave it because it's the argument stands alone if you attack an argument by saying, oh, Hitler gave it, this is literally a fallacy. It's called ad hominem, to the person. Um, you can divorce the philosophy from the person. And it's just as well because, as I said, every one of these philosophers from the past, just about, except maybe Jeremy Bentham, uh, has a serious blind spot. Uh, there's a good quote um, for this, and uh, it's a quote by Aristotle, who was a student of Plato. Uh, so he went, Socrates taught Plato, taught Aristotle, the, the best one, two, three in, in history. Um, but Aristotle had serious philosophical disagreements with Plato, and he has this quote, again, of course it's translated, I love Plato, but I love the truth more. So, you know, don't just try and defend a position because it's the position of some philosopher you like. If they say something stupid, they said something stupid. I mean, Aristotle is a genius in some respects and believe, believed some things that you just think, how can an intelligent person believe that? Uh, Aristotle was, is probably one of the greatest geniuses in history, and yet again, he says some really uh, stupid stuff. Think of, uh, I, I think this is important to say, particularly nowadays, because people are getting uh, cancelled for saying things. And it, that would cancel all of, all of philosophy, essentially. Um, I've heard musicians give this analogy, and I think it's, it's a good one. Uh, you know, Paul McCartney wrote the tune, uh, woke up with the tune of yesterday in his head, and he had to go around checking to see if it was something he'd heard, but it was just there in his head and he wrote it down and of course he put the, the word scrambled egg, how I love a scrambled egg was his placeholder uh, for, the, for the tune. Uh, and you know, he basically uh, says, it came to me, it, I'm just a conduit for this stuff. And a lot, of philosopher, uh, a lot of musicians say that. I saw an interview with Jack White saying the same thing, you just got to open yourself up and they come. So. Think of the philosophers as the conduits for the arguments. If the arguments work, it doesn't matter who says them. So don't get obsessed with a particular philosopher and say, well, I have to defend everything that person says, and I don't like that person, so, you know, dismiss them. I'm guilty of this myself. I mean, Heidegger is a famous figure, uh, a, a very 
influential philosopher of the 20th century who was kind of sympathetic to the Nazis. Uh, but if you dismiss his arguments on being because he was a Nazi sympathizer, that's making the same mistake. Okay, uh, talking of Heidegger, next thing that philosophy isn't, at least the kind of philosophy that I do, and that is obscure. Um, there's a divide in philosophy, perhaps you know this, uh, that hasn't always existed. Um, it started probably late 19th century and now it's pretty serious and it's between what is called the continental school because it's philosophy as typically practiced in continental Europe and uh, the analytic school which tends to be English language philosophy or uh, philosophy done in England, America, and Australia. Australia is probably the most extreme, and in England you might get some continental influence as well. But it's, um, the, the big divide happened in the early 20th century, uh, where you get figures like Heidegger, uh, who is definitely one of the major figures of the continental school. And I'm in the analytic school, as were all my teachers. And the analytic school um, is almost religious about clarity. Now, having said that, there are plenty of uh, philosophers in the analytic tradition where it's a hard read. Um, for example, there's a very great American philosopher still alive at NYU, Thomas Nagel. Uh, I find reading him heavy going. There was a British uh, version of Thomas Nagel, they're, they're, they're very similar in a lot of respects, of, who was a few years older than Thomas Nagel called Bernard Williams, also hard read. Um, but in general, the goal in analytic philosophy is to really state things clearly, not necessarily um, very prettily. Uh, you get some philosophers who put style over substance, and, and they can be some of the most hardcore analytic philosophers. Another guy, uh, Quine, a great American um, philosopher from the mid 20th century, right into the late 20th century. He valued style and wrote beautiful, beautiful essays, but almost the style, the beauty of the sentences det detracted from the clarity of his argument. The goal, particularly when you write a paper, is to be understandable by anybody. If you write in sentences that are, would be suitable in young adult literature, that's great. Do that. Be as clear as possible. One of uh, my first philosophy professors made a distinction between difficult and complex. He says, um, philosophy, the ideas in philosophy can be complex, but they can be broke. Uh, something that is complex is just made of a lot of ideas and can be broken down into its simple components. Difficult is something that is impenetrable and cannot be analyzed. I think the, um, and the Continental School believe that good philosophy is difficult and it's obscure. And if you read some of their sentences, boy, that's obscure. But the suspicion amongst ana the analytic school is that this is all bullshit. That there is, uh, th this is just saying something that sounds profound just because nobody can understand it. Um, if you write like that, I won't believe that you know what you're talking about. If you can't explain what you're talking about in words that the average person can get, then I don't think you really understand it. So, don't write obscurely. Keep it simple. Write as if you're writing an instruction manual for a piece of equipment, for a, a microwave oven. You know, clarity is important. Nobody cares 
about the beauty of the sentences in an instruction manual. That's what you should be doing. And give examples. Uh, examples in philosophy actually really make uh, a paper or a, a, a piece of work. There are famous examples dotted throughout, particularly 20th century philosophy. Um, and that's no accident because examples, we're just hardwired to respond to a good example. So if you're going to explain something, use a good example. Um, preferably one from your own life because that means that you've understood the topic and you've related it back to your own life. And we love that when we're reading your papers. That's like as good as it gets for someone grading a paper because we've seen a million papers that are just generic. And if you relate it back to your life and you come up with an actually applicable example drawn from your own life, mwah, do that. Okay, last thing that I'm going to say philosophy isn't is a set of mystical truths. This is sort of related to the obscure business. I think people want philosophy to be a bit like religion uh, and you get things like, uh, I remember a few years ago there was something called The Secret uh, and I never knew what The Secret was supposed to be but this idea that there is a secret, that there's a core that you need to uncover and that's it, that it, it's hidden there, it's like a code. Um, but uh, when, when you pour over these tomes of philosophy, you'll, you'll get out this, this secret and suddenly, bam, you're, you're transformed. Uh, a bit like the idea of achieving nirvana in Buddhism or something. That's not what you're going to get out of philosophy. I'm sorry. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of kernels the, of, of truth that you can get from philosophy. There's conclusions that you can arrive at, but they're always provisional. It's not like, oh, this is the truth and once you've got this, bam, you can stop. You got there. No, maybe later on an argument will come across that undermines the thing that you thought was a truth. Um, the same uh, philosophy professor who, who talked about the difficult versus complex had had a nice little, and it's not a mystical truth, but he had a nice little um, aphorism. He said, philosophy is not about answering questions, it's about questioning answers. Now, like all aphorisms, that's flawed because philosophers definitely do try to answer questions. Uh, but the process of philosophy, philosophy as an activity, is about always always challenging something, always asking questions. Again, back to Socrates. This is what Socrates does in all of the dialogues that you read where he's the main character. He asks questions, he challenges. People come to him who claim to know something and claim to have a mystical truth, an access to the truth. And he chips away at it until they are exposed. Um, again, you can get too, you can take that too far. That's, that's, you, that can lead to a very skeptical position that there's, there is no knowledge, that there is nothing that you can know. And um, that doesn't seem to be Socrates' position. But uh, don't come at it thinking that's what you're going to get out of it. This is a bit disappointing, right? I mean, it would be nice if we found a, a, a book and when we opened it and read it and said, oh yeah, that's it. You're not going to get that out of philosophy. You are going to have some of your, um, your current beliefs challenged. That's good. That's great. And, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to give them up. It just means that, oh, this is a challenge that I hadn't considered. Is there a response to it? So again, it's an ongoing process. It's a process of um, constantly reevaluating your beliefs. That's what philosophy requires. The openness to challenge your beliefs. Don't come in and say, this is the kind of person I am, and if anybody questions this. This is the other thing. People get very possessive about core beliefs they have. They, so, some core beliefs they say, 
this cannot be challenged. If you challenge this, you are challenging me. And they get very angry at arguments that challenge it. That is definitely opposite to the spirit of philosophy. You should be prepared to have your most basic intuitions challenged. And that's good for you. I mean, it's like the Catholic Church did this. There's something called the devil's advocate. You've heard this phrase. It's actually from uh, the Catholic Church, where a trainee priest would be confronted by another priest who was the devil's advocate, who would give all of these atheistic or anti-Christian arguments to the priest. So, and the priest had to be able to respond to them, had to be able to take them seriously, but come up with a reason against it. The, the, the priest wasn't allowed to just say, no, 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 not listening. No, they were supposed to respond to them and take them seriously. And that's great. That's what philosophy is. Philosophy should allow us to discuss uh, horrific ideas, ideas that are very much opposed to our own, with the point of responding to them and explaining why they're wrong. So philosophers tend to ask questions where people think that uh, the questions are stupid, like, you know, is killing bad or something like that. But there's a point to that. It's not just, uh, you know, philosophers are, aren't necessarily seriously confused about this issue. What trying to do is get at the reasons why killing is bad and if it's bad in all circumstances or, for example, is euthanasia permi permissible. So, um, philosophy is a process. I guess that's the closest I can get to telling you what philosophy is rather than what it isn't. But I hope these are of some help when you're writing your first philosophy paper.